Tonight, the search for four people swept away by floodwaters in Nova Scotia. There's four, four members of our community that we're still looking for. Among the missing, two children. The dangerous conditions and the incredible damage the floods left behind. Thousands of tourists flee raging wildfires on a Greek island. I've never been so scared my entire life. The chaotic rescue effort. Fake ads trying to trick Canadians and using video of journalists to do it. $765 million. That's me, but not my voice. I thought it was very violating. How you can spot what's real and what's a deep fake. This is The National with Ian Hennemansing. Four people in Nova Scotia, including two children, are still missing tonight after torrential rains hit the province over the weekend. The scale of it leaving people stunned. A pile of rain, and it never stopped. It was just like somebody opened up the skies. This here was a, was a hard thing. The waters collapsed hillsides and washed roads and bridges away, complicating rescue efforts and that continuing search. The storm system started Friday, coming up from the south, a channel of extraordinary rainfall up the middle of the peninsula. Places like Halifax, Bedford, all the way up to the Windsor West Hans area, getting an astounding 200 millimeters or more. But it wasn't just the amount of rain, it's how fast it came down. Submerging roads, stranding drivers, four people in two separate vehicles are missing. Katie Nicholson has the frantic effort to find them. A helicopter hovers low over a marshy waterway. On the ground, search and rescue teams also hard at work. It's hot, it's very humid. Ground is soft in areas, uh, a lot of onshore roads, uh, onshore footing on, on some of the areas. Still, the search for the missing is relentless. Among them, two children. The truck they were last seen in found by dive teams, empty. Teams also scouring the water for a youth and an adult who were in another vehicle. All four believed to have been carried off in the torrent. When you keep on thinking back to the four, four members of our community that we're still looking for, um, that's, that's where our energy is right now. The uncertainty felt deeply within the county. It's a vast community, but it's a small community. Everybody talks to each other. Everybody's looking out for each other. Everybody's interacted with this family in one way or another. In the sheer violence of Friday night's storm, many had close calls as floodwaters swallowed cars whole. I jump from the top of the car, swim for a little and go over the hill or to the road. It's something bigger than you, so you just try to find a way to escape. It was scary. It was scary. Peyton Diebel and her 80-year-old grandmother escaped their building by boat. Her mother, trapped by the storm, couldn't help. I couldn't get down, and no. that mm -hmm. was the most frustrating thing yeah. for me, was not being able to help them. It's okay. This family reunited after the storm, while the families of the missing are left to wait and wonder and hope. Uh, Katie, officials uh, are dissuading people from helping out in the search and rescue effort, uh, in part because of safety, but there are other reasons as well. Yeah, that's right. This is highly specialized work. It requires training. The search and rescue manager told me what people don't realize is they're not looking for people. They're looking for clues, little signs that can help them either zone in in an area or exclude it. And what they don't realize is when people who don't know what they're doing start going through those areas, they can obscure those vital clues that are so important to help locate the missing. Katie Nicholson reporting from Bedford tonight. Thank you. In parts of the province, floodwaters have started to recede. And as Shane Luck shows us, people are taking stock of the extensive damage to a province already hit hard by unprecedented wildfires. Paul Chang takes inventory of the damage to his tropical fish store, right beside the muddy Sackville River. On Saturday, the river was inside the business. We had about 12 inches of water that came in through the store. He's thankful it didn't get high enough to flood the tanks, but the damage was done. Others trying to deal with flooded basements, like Laurie McLeod-Doyle. 
it's practically biblical. You know, we're just waiting for the locusts now, right? <laughs> we got the fire, the floods. You know, it's crazy. Premier Tim Houston said he's requested federal disaster assistance. The province now forced to rebuild again after a string of major climate disasters over the past year and a half. But just in that time, um, serious flooding in, in Cape Breton, um, Hurricane Fiona, massive devastation across many parts of this province, northern Nova Scotia. Uh, fires, devastating fires. We're still trying to um, um, get through and to um, re respond to Hurricane Fiona and clean up. We're still trying to, you know, look the house, the fire situation is still, like, look at the impact on people's lives. And now here we are today. About an hour's drive west of Halifax, crews were already at work doing road repairs. Water smashed apart roughly 50 roads and triggered landslides. Rail lines were damaged and six bridges were completely destroyed. It was just like somebody opened up the skies. Water was coming in, you couldn't come out here, you just wash your way down the street. It was that bad. Officials estimate between 500 and 600 people are still displaced around the province, 200 of them in Halifax. Melanie McWhorter was rescued from her home by a fire truck. I was standing in the middle of my driveway up to my knees in water. Uh, our basement is fully flooded. Um, our neighbours are flooded out. Officials are still asking people to limit their travel. The province and the city of Halifax are asking their workers to stay home over the next 24 hours so repair work can get done faster. But for some, this latest disaster will leave another lasting mark. Shana Luck, CBC News, Halifax. Let's bring in CBC News meteorologist Ryan Snodden. And, and first of all, put into perspective how unusual this was. 1971, Ian, uh, Hurricane Beth, the last time that the Halifax area saw anything like this, 200 to 250 millimeters or more of rain. Much of this falling in a six to 12 hour period. Rivers, streams, let alone infrastructure, culverts just cannot keep up with that amount of rain in such a short period of time. This seemed to catch everybody off guard in terms of the ferocity of, of this rainstorm. Was it difficult to forecast? These setups are difficult, no doubt about it. That said, we've seen this setup countless times before. Tropical moisture streaming in from the south, model guidance in the 100 to 150 millimeter range locally. What changed was the thunderstorms on the smaller synoptic scale, and that's where the models still have uh, still have a little more difficulty picking things up here. When you see these thunderstorm clusters, one feeding another, feeding another, what we call training storms. As one storm dissipates, the outflow feeds the next, feeds the next, feeds the next. And so the same areas get hit over and over again by these very heavy thunderstorms. And because the front was so slow moving in, just a 50 kilometer wide radius basically was getting hit by these same storms over and over again Friday evening into the overnight and Saturday. That's why this turned from a fairly routine looking event to a historic one in just a matter of hours. Yeah, it sure was, Ryan. Thank you very much. Thank you. In BC tonight, more people have fled their homes due to wildfires, the worst season on record for this province. Stephanie Mercier shows us how the international community is answering the call for help. Smoke billows into a blue sky, an ominous sign for those waiting, worried they'll be forced from their homes. I don't know what else to do other than to wait and hopefully not get the order. If we get through today, I think we might be okay. I was selling this, so... Her family home threatened by a fire near Kamloops, which doubled in size overnight. She joins thousands of British Columbians waiting under evacuation alerts. There are nearly 500 wildfires burning in the province now, with clusters in the northeast, the central interior and the south. Most of the land burned so far has been in the Prince George Fire Centre. That's where these Brazilian firefighters, who arrived this weekend, are heading. It's grateful to be here. It's, I'm very glad. 100 of them here to bolster the ranks of the crews already on the ground, fighting BC's worst wildfire season on record. We are incredibly grateful to each and every one of them. They're arriving on a weekend when the BC Wildfire Service is in mourning. Anyone who could take the time joined a memorial Saturday for 19-year-old Devin Gale, who died after being pinned under a tree earlier this month. 
Gail was fighting a fire alongside her brother, Nolan. I'm grateful to have been close to you when the tree fell. I'm grateful to have been one of the people who pulled you out from under it because it meant I got a few extra minutes with you. An emotional tribute for a friend and colleague. Then, back to work. Dropping water onto parched ground, trying to slow the movement of the flames. Thought we've been very lucky so far, considering the rest of the province, you know, but uh, now we're, we're in our own situation. Another BC community on edge as this wildfire season drags on. Stephanie Mercier, CBC News, Vancouver. Wildfires are also forcing mass evacuations in Greece, including on the island of Corfu and another packed full of tourists. Flames push closer to busy coastal resorts this weekend, setting off panic. Sarah Levitt takes us to the island of Rhodes and into the rush to get people to safety. Under a cloud of smoke and an orange sky, residents and tourists attempted to get to safer ground. Part of what Greece says is its largest wildfire evacuation ever. Since Tuesday, firefighters have been working to contain the flames on the islands of Rhodes. Known for its beach resorts, it's a popular spot for tourists. We'd seen the smoke for a few days and we were told by the hotel manager, it's okay, it's okay. That changed abruptly as the winds did. Authorities feared the fire that was mainly in the interior would push into coastal resorts. Evacuation notices left people scrambling. Well, we got, got what we could, just pinched um, passports, passports everything, money. left everything else. There wasn't enough coaches to move 800 people, but the fire was coming, the smoke was coming. So we all set off on foot. I walked 12 miles in this heat. Nearly 19,000 people were moved to safety. Some got on Coast Guard vessels and private boats off the island. Others hunkered down in schools or community centres converted to shelters. It is horrendous. It's absolutely, I've never been so scared my entire life. Rhodes is a popular destination for Brits. The UK government said Sunday it is sending in a team to help its citizens. At Rhodes Airport, Greece's tourism minister defended her country's response. A small part of the island has been affected. Everything else operates uh, very regularly. We just want to make sure that everybody's safe. Greece is suffering under an oppressive heat wave. Temperatures Sunday climbing as high as 46 degrees Celsius. It saw more than 60 new wildfires spark and more people forced to flee. On roads, many airlines have suspended flights in, instead using their planes to get tourists out. Firefighters, meanwhile, continue to fight the flames and take stock of what's left behind. Sarah Levitt, CBC News, Montreal. Turning to Spain now, where it's unclear who will govern after tonight's close election failed to produce a clear winner. A right-wing bloc won more seats than the ruling socialists, but not enough to take the reins. Here's Christine Birak on what's at stake for one of Europe's major powers. For Spain's Democratic Prime Minister Pedro Sanchez, the snap election was a gamble that doesn't appear to have paid off, as Spain could become the latest European nation to swing towards the right. As predicted, the Christian centre-right People's Party won the most votes, but not an outright majority. To form government, it will need to partner with the far-right Vox Party, along with other regional parties, some of which have expressed hesitation over working with Vox. Vox really reminds quite a lot of the North American uh, right wing or center right or radical right. Angelos Chrysogelos teaches politics and international relations at London Metropolitan University. He says if the People's Party partners with Vox, it would be the first time a far right party has entered government in Spain in nearly 50 years. The rise of Vox has been quite meteoric. Spain is a country that has a long history of a right-wing dictatorship in the 50s, 60s and the 70s. And in a way, Spanish democracy was formed in opposition to this experience of a right-wing dictatorship. Vox has a nationalist agenda. The party opposes abortion rights, denies climate change and rejects the socialist government's pro-LGBT policies. 
and it could influence politics beyond Spain, which holds the presidency of the European Union until the end of the year. Experts say Europe's wider shift to the right could impact green agendas along with other policies. European politics across Europe really is focused on migration, having strong positions on, on, on uh, border protection. Despite the loss, the Prime Minister can try and strike deals with smaller regional parties in order to stay in power. But if neither party can form a coalition, Spanish voters will head back to the polls. Christine Birak, CBC News, London. Tens of thousands of demonstrators are on the streets tonight in Israel as lawmakers prepare to vote on a controversial plan to overhaul the judiciary. This is the scene in Jerusalem, police using water cannons to disperse some of those protesting against the changes. The proposed law would curb the power of Israel's Supreme Court to overrule government policies. In Tel Aviv, crowds in favor of the changes gathered to show their support. They argue the current law puts too much power in the hands of unelected judges. All of this comes as the country's prime minister is recovering in hospital from an emergency procedure to put in a pacemaker. Benjamin Netanyahu is recovering well and says he will be in Parliament for tomorrow's vote. At the Women's World Cup in Australia, another player is out with what may be a torn knee ligament, one of several top soccer stars missing the tournament altogether over the injury. Research shows women are more prone to these injuries than men, but as Lindsay Duncombe explains, experts say it's more than biology at play. There's a brutal sisterhood in women's soccer, and Gabby Garten is part of it. When you've gone through it, you just get this sort of anguished feeling in your chest where your heart just sinks because you know exactly what that entails, what that, what that injury means. Garten plays pro in Australia. She once represented Argentina in the World Cup. Back in 2014, she tore her ACL. And as soon as it happened, you just, you just know. The anterior cruciate ligament keeps the knee stable when it rotates. Canada's Janine Becky injured hers in March. It's not fair. I know it's not fair. She's not playing in Australia. One of 18 athletes, many of them superstars, missing the tournament because of ACL injuries. That's pretty much an entire team. The number of players out of the World Cup highlights a long-standing problem across women's sport. Research shows female athletes are between two and eight times more likely to suffer ACL injuries compared to men. Figuring out why is complicated. You see, it's a very small ligament that sits inside the joint It's here. right in the middle. It's right in the middle. Melbourne's La Trobe University is one of the few places researching the issue. We really don't know enough about women playing any sport. We definitely don't know enough about women playing football. And we definitely don't know about women playing elite football. Researcher Kay Crosley says physical differences between men and women are just part of the puzzle. We often focus too much on sort of the biology of the woman, so the shape of her pelvis and her hormones. There are so many other factors that can really um, influence a woman's risk of tearing her ACL. Women, she says, get paid less, train less, travel more, and don't have enough time to work on injury prevention. Gender inequality is part of the problem, says this UBC researcher. When you don't have that same level of investment in resources, in coaching, in training, basically what happens is it gets, it, it, the bottom kind of falls out of things and you start seeing problems. And one of the biggest cracks I think we see is the girls tearing their ACL. Just take the pitch Garten plays on. Muddy, ripped up grass, easy to slip on. The men that play at the same level that we're playing here, they play on like basically stadiums. Better conditions, she says, could mean fewer women will endure injury and miss out on playing the game. Lindsay Duncombe, CBC News, Melbourne. Canadian Olympians preparing for the next Winter Games are facing a major hurdle. Why athletes are forced to go abroad. I am currently at home, air quotes. The days-long road trip for some Canadian snacks. I'd like him to remember he had to have a stoop enough to drive me to Canada to buy him chips. And the box office battle. 
So who won the weekend? It's the only one ever going to tell the truth. Truth about the universe. We're back in two. It is victory again for Jonas Vingegaard. The Danish rider won the Tour de France for the second straight year. The race was 3,400 kilometers. It included two stages in the Alps. Vingegaard says he hopes to come back for a third win next year. Ariane Titmus, here she comes. Titmus, gold, world record. And the Australian won gold at the World Aquatic Championships, reclaiming the 400-meter freestyle world record in a stunning 3 minutes, 55.38 seconds. The last record set by Canada's Summer McIntosh in March. McIntosh narrowly missed the podium. She placed fourth. She will compete again on Tuesday in the 200-meter freestyle. Canada will no longer host its only men's World Cup downhill ski race. Lake Louise had been the site of the event for more than 40 years, but now it's been dropped this season due to funding issues. And as Aaron Collins tells us, this is the latest blow to athletes hoping to train and compete at home. Canada's only men's World Cup ski race has reached the finish line. The loss of revenue, a big blow to developing the sport here. Probably the biggest problem we have in, in sport today is, is a lack of resources and a lack of funding. Um, it, it's about a $70 million problem right now. Ken Reed, the defending champion, skied in control throughout. The slopes of Lake Louise have been hosting races for decades. Without a World Cup event, one less reason for Canada's winter athletes to train here. Canada's aging winter sport infrastructure adding to the problem, no longer meeting international standards for training. These ski jumps used in the 88 Winter Olympics here in Calgary are now permanently closed. Many of Canada's elite athletes now heading overseas to find the facilities they need. I am currently at home, air quotes. Um, I'm in Sled Slovenia. Well, that's what drew Canada's first ever world champion in ski jumping overseas. Many of Canada's best looking outside the country to train, a trend that could reverse if Canada were to host another Winter Games. I'm an Olympic athlete. I'm from a small sport that would hugely benefit from having an Olympics, but I know that I'm not the only one who would say this. But not everyone believes renovating or building new Olympic venues here in Canada is a good idea. You're going to end up with either significant costs that extend beyond what was initially promised, or you're going to end up with a bunch of useless facilities that sit around. This economist says that every country having their own winter sport training facilities doesn't make sense. Then maybe what you have then are these hubs where athletes are going to say, we want to train in this area. And that city then might see that there's an economic justification for investing in high value facilities. But that could make training more expensive for Canada's athletes. Unfair according to some who say all Canadians benefit from their success. The athlete uh, representing their sport in their hometown, in their home country, with their people watching them and supporting them is an important part of the experience and it is important for Canadians too. Uh, so there is more than just money going on here. Well, there will be a cost for Canadian athletes to continue to win Olympic gold. The question is, who should pay? Aaron Collins, CBC News, Calgary. After so much hype, eyes were trained on the box office this weekend to see how the Barbenheimer phenomenon would play out. The short answer, very, very well. Is anyone ever going to tell the truth? truth about the universe? The joint openings of the Barbie and Oppenheimer movies captivated crowds. Barbie came out on top, raking in $155 million U.S., making it the biggest opening of the year. Oppenheimer brought in more than 80 million, helping create what's expected to be the fourth biggest box office weekend of all time. Scammers are using AI to try to get your money. Have a passive income of $10,000 per week. The deep fakes of politicians and journalists, including me, $765 million. Why platforms like Facebook struggle to take them down. It's not an easy fix and a major milestone for a Canadian slugger. Bottom drills it, Dave But what did it take to get here? Well, you know, I felt 
pretty intense hatred and anger. I revisit my conversation with Joey Votto. The National takes you deeper into the story shaping our world next. Have you seen this ad on Facebook or Instagram? It's a fake. In fact, it's part of a series of fake ads involving Canadian news anchors and politicians designed to trick you into handing money over to a company for some sort of investment scheme or scam. We're not entirely sure, so we decided to dig into it. I'm guessing a lot of people who are watching us right now haven't used it. I hadn't used it at all until yesterday. It started, for us anyway, with this video posted on Instagram. It begins with an excerpt from a real interview that we did here on The National, except that interview is about chat GPT. In the fake ad, it's edited onto a promotion for some sort of investment scheme. Uh, this is how much money I'm making every single week online. Look at that, $7,800 there. A woman reached out to me on Twitter to say her sister clicked on the link and lost money to what she calls a scam. She said, my sister is not a naive person, but sadly it was their usage of your image that had her trust them as she, like myself, considers you a trusted journalist. But why do these ads keep on appearing even though they've been reported as fraudulent? We contacted Meta, the company that owns Facebook and Instagram. They wouldn't do an interview, but they did give us a statement. Here's an excerpt. It's against our policies to run ads that use public figures in a deceptive nature in order to try to scam people out of money. We have put substantial resources towards tackling these kinds of ads. But the ads still keep popping up despite people reporting it. And it gets worse. We know that users of the platform manage more than $765 million. Last month, a colleague found this on his Facebook feed. That's not my voice. And it appears my mouth was altered to make it look like I'm saying it on CBC. And can have a passive income of $10,000 per week. And it's not just me. The same thing happened to opposition leader Pierre Polyev on what's made to look like a CTV newscast. After we contacted Polyev's office, they said they were trying to get it removed but there's no guarantee that will happen quickly or at all. Well, let's bring in someone who watches ads online with a critical eye. Claire Atkin is with Check My Ads. Thanks for joining us. Hi, thanks for having me. When you saw this ad, what did you think? I thought it was very violating to see a person in their image who has not said those words, but is who is saying those words on camera. They are using this to make money and they are using your image because of your credibility to make money. And that's a very violating thing to do. So as you analyze this, what were you able to figure out? What this is, is it's predicting how much of the content of what you say and what your image is, is artificial intelligence versus real footage. It looks like they've clipped different things together to make it look like it's part of a larger narrative. Mm -hmm. it, is of course not a part of a larger narrative. This is part of a scam that they are running. So these ads have appeared on Instagram and they have appeared on Facebook, so meta properties. Can't they stop this? Can't they figure this out before they post them? Yes, they can. They absolutely can. And the fact that they're not is an indictment to their ability to manage their own platforms. We have seen over and over again that they have disallowed climate change uh, related ads, things that are about very real issues where they have let on ads that are to do with scams or to do with disinformation. Meta says it eventually removed that first ad, and after we contacted them a couple of times, the second one disappeared on one account, but moments later we found it on another. Pablo Singh, a lawyer with an expertise on deep fakes, says if Meta can't eliminate it, there's no quick, easy legal recourse. If somebody out there saw a deep fake of themselves and wanted to, to get it off of a, a media platform, what would you as a lawyer say to them? I would say contact the social media platform, understand that they have an internal mechanism to remove such videos and try to go through that way of removing the video. And if that doesn't work? If that doesn't work, speak with a lawyer. But that process with a lawyer is not going to be inexpensive or short. That's right. It's, um, it's not an easy fix. That sometimes is the gap that the victim of a deep fake will experience. There's something floating around over a long period of time, and it takes a very long time before a remedy is actually given. And as deep fakes get better, this problem will likely get worse. So three things to keep in mind. First, look at the videos, especially on social media, with a critical eye. No Canadian news anchor is going to promote an investment scheme. If you see one, it's fake. 
Second, contact the platform. Facebook and Instagram say they take action, so if you see a fake or a suspected fake, at least report it. And finally, if you do get fooled and lose money, don't be embarrassed. Go to the Canadian Anti-Fraud Centre to get some more advice. Next, the Canadian baseball star Unstoppable at 39. You strike me as a guy who's intense, is that fair to say? Yeah, with things that matter, yeah. Joey Votto opens up about his career and what nearly derailed it. Next. Canadian superstar Joey Votto hitting a big milestone, 350 home runs. He's now just the second Canadian to do that. And Votto's homers are just part of what's been a stellar career. But it's his life outside of baseball that makes him one of the most intriguing players. During spring training in Arizona, I spoke with him about his achievements and life beyond the ballpark. Here's Joey Votto. It didn't take long for Joey Votto to show he belonged in the big leagues. High fly ball. His first major league hit in his first major league start is his first major league home run. That was 16 years ago. In his long career, the six-time All-Star has put up numbers that could land him in baseball's Hall of Fame. But what makes Votto so interesting goes beyond his excellence on the field. Joey Votto back home again. Very excited to be back in the lineup. His best season came after a personal tragedy overcome by grief, then anxiety. And a base hit into right field for Votto. Long run for... And later in his career, another twist. Votto, intensely competitive and private, turned to social media to show a much different side of his personality. Game. Let's go Reds. Joey Votto, thanks for joining us. Thanks for having me. In our interview series, we focus on, on Canadians who have achieved excellence in their field. And we also look for, for moments uh, that changed everything for, for that person. And I, I'm just curious, is there a moment in your career that, that you would identify as, you know, that's the moment that changed everything? Yeah, uh, my father dying. Um, you know, I felt pretty intense hatred and anger and uh, I felt a, like a darkness and I played with a lot of um, uh, I played with an edge with an anger with a with a uh, not a good good um, space for a stretch of time I was mourning my father's the loss of my father depressed I was not feeling very much in life You know, this was a time when I don't think a lot of professional athletes would have talked about that publicly. Was that tough to, to, to discuss publicly? Um, I'd say that, um, I'd say I'd still a little apprehensive about talking about the subject just because I, can, I only know so much about it as far as being able to speak on it publicly. But I can say, I can say my experience was, uh, was a common experience. For a lot of people, uh, it's an uncommon, feel, uncommon feeling when you're in the middle of it, but it's a very common experience um, for a lot of people. And, and I, I felt like I got through it. I got help. I, I started seeing a therapist. Uh, and I felt like when it was all said and done, when I came out of that, that morning, that stretch of time, uh, with the help of the therapist and with the, um, the uh, experience of becoming a, uh, um, a different person, I, f I felt like I was, I was in a much better place in my life. And um, it just so happened that and it ended up taking care of, and not taking care of, but it ended up making me a much better version of myself as an athlete, as a, as a baseball uh, player. Is 
the slider, gets it popped up. Votto down the line into foul ground. The rolled up tarp makes the catch. Tag at third, throws the play. Here's the play, the tag from Stevenson. He's out. A double play. That was an incredible play. Oh, my goodness. Dad? You want to have a catch? I'd like that. And I remember watching what I had uh, in the field, field of Dreams. I watched it often. And, um, you know, I didn't realize it when I was young because I had a father to play catch with. I had a bond to maintain. And then when you lose him, you know, it's gone for good. To be able to wear a uniform and walk through the corn and then play that game, um, you know, I, I was unhealthy at the time, but I couldn't have missed that game. Right? And um, it was a wonderful experience. I um, used to play catch with my father from eight, nine years old, and uh, it was a daily thing. He wanted me, a, me to be a pitcher like John Smoltz. And um, we threw every day, he'd catch me, we'd uh, share that moment together. And you know, he passed away about 14 years ago. And here I am at the Field of Dreams, you know, longing, longing for a catch with my father, but still basking in this with a smile, knowing that uh, you know, if he was here, we'd, he would have loved it and we would have shared it together. So it's, it's very much a full circle moment for me. There's another really cool thing about that game. I was watching a tape of the telecast, and this is not an exhibition game. This is a major league ball player who wants to win that game, who's having an interview with a guy, and you were able to handle all of that at once. It was pretty impressive. Yeah, it was a part of the production of the game. I don't know if it's something I'll, I'll be excited about doing again in the future. <laughs> you know, um, it's very important to stay, in, in my experience, to stay focused on the game. Yeah. So it was a bit of a distraction, but it was a one-off game. We're talking right now. I can't articulate how much it matters for me to perform and perform well. As an Still athlete. To, as an athlete. No distractions. This is my 17th major league season. You know, I don't have friends and family that come through. You know, just because I can't, I can't give up a day. I can't. Um, you know, I, I can't be distracted by you know in any way. And it saddens me in a way because I haven't been able to share so much of my career with my family. My mom would love to be a part of this more often. I'd love to have my brothers here, my friends. But I can't help but be um, solely focused on, on, on this, on, on doing this well. So to answer your, your question, I felt like it was a, a good moment. People enjoyed it, but it was a bit of a distraction and I don't like distractions, so. But it was an amazing thing to watch, but it, I wasn't then surprised to discover you're a chess player. And I just thought, I wonder if Why this would is... you say that? So the only reason that I mentioned chess in terms of watching what you did on the field there is I thought, here's a guy who's got a brain that can work in lots of different ways no. at the same time, no? No, I'm not a smart man. No? No, 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 no. I'm good at one thing <laughs> Which at is... a time. Oh, okay, one yeah. thing at a time, yeah. all right. Okay, so we'll put, but, but you love chess. And, and you went to uh, yeah. a club in Toronto? NX Chess Club, yeah. yeah. I, I, I compete and I travel in this Reds uniform in Cincinnati. I, I absolutely love it, but it can be a bit isolating. So whenever I go back home to Toronto, um, I need friends. You know, I need a social group. Or else I'm at home all the time, which is not good. And so I've been hunting different ways to, to um, find a social group. And I started playing a little bit of chess during, during the pandemic. And I was like, you know what, I want to join a chess club. And I started, um, st started going to Annex downtown in Toronto. And it was beautiful because it was like 100 plus people Everybody competing. Nobody looks up from, the, from their board. Nobody cares about me at all. You, you strike me as a guy who's intense. Is that fair to say? Yeah, what, with things that matter, yeah. Yeah. Um, and an introvert. I've done one of those personality tests. I think I'm like 50-50. I lean <laughs> introvert, I think. Because but, but, I need people. Yeah. It's like this gives me joy right now. Yeah, well, 
I'm glad, <laughs> but I, 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 I can relate to that. But, but what's interesting is when you wanted to like reach out and have social contact, one of the things that gave you joy was walking into a chess club where you said nobody even put their head up. I loved it. Yeah, yeah. of course. I like being in a group. I love being in a group where everyone's looking in the same direction. Yeah. I don't like when the, look, the looking is happening at me. I find that that drains my energy and this gives me energy, if that makes sense. So like when everybody's locked in on their board and I say bye and hello and what, ha or hello and bye, what have you, and then I head out, it's like, wow, that just felt so good. Hi everyone, it's Joey Votto. For those of you watching this, I just wanted to share that I've decided to join social media. White, white, wipe it down. White, 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 wipe it down. White, 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 wipe it down. White, wipe it down. White. I know, I know so many celebrities, or know of so many celebrities who fear social media or try to step back from it. You've stepped right into it. Why? I view it as like a, a toy. You know, it's like um, I'm not trying to prop myself up or look good, but my, my, I think my personality is to be playful and to have fun. I also thought it wasn't very fair that I wasn't allowed. Everybody else has access to social, and yet I, I didn't. And I'm like, Every, there's so many people that are having some fun. I'd like to have fun too. So I've dabbled with it. Um, it's a bit distracting at times, so I have to manage that. A lot of Canadians watching this interview are gonna be watching you play baseball this season with a, a, a keener interest. And I wonder, what should they be looking for? Um, it's, 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 it's challenging as you get older in this sport. It's challenging, you know, because you're competing against your previous self. And if they're watching me, know that um, I'm relatable because I'm doing something I, I'm not as good as I used to be and that I'm trying my very best. And I'm, I'm problem solving and I'm trying to figure out ways within the rules to be as successful and as helpful to my team as I possibly can. The average person that watches me play, I hope can relate because we all go through things that seem uh, insurmountable or are um, challenging. And then when we face them, we become a better version of, of ourselves. And when we get through them, there's a feeling of elation. And so if I'm successful this year, as an individual, if you're asking about me individually, if I'm successful, I'm, 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 I'm you. Overcoming something and uh, feeling an immense amount of satisfaction and doing something that I have my doubts about that I can do, but if I end up doing, um, it would feel pretty darn good. I can't wait to watch. It's yeah, been really nice it. talking to you. Yeah, Thank you thanks. very much. Yeah, thanks. What he didn't realize when he said that in spring training is he was going to have a pretty major injury, missed a lot of the season. But as you saw at the beginning with home run number 350, he's back. Coming up, an epic road trip for a very tangy reason. Last year, we drove the Alaska Highway. He discovered ketchup chips, so they just became his favorite. This father-son duo goes the distance for their favorite snack in our moment. Okay, so this is not your regular grocery run, but one that took days all for bags of ketchup chips. Jacob Lieberman loves the uniquely Canadian flavor, but they're impossible to find near his home in Virginia, so he and his dad set off on a road trip northward. Their quest for ketchup chips is our moment. I'd like him to remember, yeah, dad was stupid enough to drive me to Canada to buy him chips. Jacob and I love traveling, and last year we drove the Alaska Highway. He discovered ketchup chips, so they just became his favorite. So we took a road trip to go buy ketchup chips. And Gertrude, our army jeep, which has no doors, 
max speed 72 kilometers an hour. It took us two full days to drove across the border the next morning, hit the no frills. We were in Canada maybe an hour. We bought 40. <laughs> I figured I'd get enough to last them for a year till we come back up to Canada next summer and finish the rest of visiting all the Canadian provinces and territories. There is a company called HERS that makes them here, but Jacob says they're not the same. But the funniest story is coming through the border crossing both ways. We had a woman on the Canadian side and she's asking us what we're doing and she kind of looked at us with disbelief. And then coming back into Canada, the guy was just busting up laughing about it. It was about the chips, but it wasn't really about the chips. It was about a road trip and something fun to do. I'm pretty sure my parents have sent boxes of ketchup chips to my sister in the United States, so I get it, 100%. That is The National for July 23rd. Have a great night.